The outgoing year 2020 saw a huge chunk of the global economy devastated by the coronavirus. For Nigeria in particular, it has been doubly difficult in the face of pre-existing economic handicaps like instability in oil prices, soaring inflation, and dwindling investment in infrastructure. However, on New Year Day, January 1, 2021, the African Continental Free Trade Area kicked in, offering a common platform for countries to trade and leverage on the comparative economic strength of the continent. Joining us now to discuss the launch of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and Nigeria's preparedness to participate in the economic bloc, and of course, Nigeria's manufacturing outlook for 2021 is Mansour Ahmed, President Manufacturers Association of Nigeria and an executive director at Dangote Group. Mr. Mansour Ahmed, good morning and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning and thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. And well, morning, let's, let's start with, uh, you know, on an introductory note. Uh, first, how significant is the uh, AFC uh, TA uh, coming into effect on uh, January 1, 2021? What are the benefits uh, in terms of the expectations and, you know, the long-term effects in terms of intra-African trade, cooperation, integration, uh, before we begin to talk about whether... Nigeria is well positioned to take advantage of uh, this new trade regime in Africa. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I, I believe that the coming into effect of the African Continental Free Trade Era Agreement on the 1st of January 2021, perhaps is one of the most significant uh, economic uh, developments that has taken place in the continent, perhaps since uh, the end of colonialism. As we all know, trade is a major part, major component of the economic activity. And we are aware that uh, over the past centuries, perhaps, generally Africa has been trading, but has been trading uh, with um, other nations and other regions on the basis of an unbalanced trading activity in the context that Africa is, has always been the source of basic inputs, the source of raw materials, the source of basically labor creation uh, uh, um, uh, commodities and um, at a price which is not det determined by Africans. On the other hand, Africa basically imports all its uh, basic inputs um, at a price which is determined by those who supply us. And this unbalanced trading arrangement has obviously contributed to the law development in most African countries, perhaps in the whole of Africa, over these many decades. The AFCFTA is intended to change that. First of all, to uh, encourage and allow and support African countries to trade among themselves, to build the capacity not only to trade among themselves, but also to be equal partners in the global trading uh, arrangement. And the consequence of this, of course, is that it will make Africa, um, it will boost industrialization in Africa, it will create in Africa the capacity to create economic activities on a much larger scale. Now, trade, uh, perhaps, is, is, uh, has been going on for centuries. Um, and I believe that we all, everybody is aware that the trading activities that take place determine the strength of different nations. The bigger the market, uh, the stronger the economy. And you, when you look at Africa, over the past decades, uh, the total trade that Africa does, of the total trade that Africa does with the global community, only 13% or so is trade between African countries. The rest is trade between Africa and non-African regions. Now, this has contribu contributed to the, as I said before, to the Lord Bad Fund of Africa. The AFCFTA is to change that, and that is why it is so significant. What we expect is that Going forward, because this is not obviously uh, um, 
uh, 100 meter dash. It's a long, it's a long track. And the intention is that over the years, as the FCFCA takes hold, more and more trade between African countries will take place. Um, Africa will build the capacity to, um, to manufacture, if you like, and to provide services uh, that will go into the African market, but also that will go into other markets. So the consequence of this will be instead of each, each country um, trading with other countries and perhaps with the global, uh, in the global market as a small country, uh, now we have a larger market. We are moving from Nigeria, for instance, from a market of maybe 200 million people to a market of 1.3 billion people from an economy of um, barely uh, a few billion dollars to an economy of 2.5 or 2.6 billion dollars. These are huge developments. This is a major content jump uh, that will take place and that will change the narrative for African economy, economies. And we believe that uh, as this takes hold, it will also give Africa the, a stronger voice, a stronger position in the global economic community. Uh, and that is why this AFCFTA is of utmost importance and is a major, a major development in Africa's uh, uh, economic development. Mm. You seem very optimistic. However, you have also expressed concern about the capacity of Nigeria to compete effectively. You granted an interview to our sister outfit this day. It is true that the full implementation would take many years to come, but it also seems that the challenges for a country such as ours is as diverse as the opportunities you have just ruled out. So are there any deliberate efforts that you are seeing that are convincing enough? And could you share some of the concerns you have about the capacity to compete effectively? Well, thank you very much. Yes, as I said before, this is a marathon. It's a long, long journey. And of course, um, like all uh, journeys such as this, uh, there are challenges, and we'll have to be prepared to meet those challenges. First of all, in terms of our capacity to produce the goods and services that will um, go into trade, not only in the intra-African intra region, but also with other Africans, we clearly today have very low capacity. Our manufacturing capacity is virtually, um, is very little. And if you look at the range of um, trading activities, trading in manufactured goods in, in Africa uh, or in, in the world as a whole is basically probably less than 3% of the total trade. So we clearly will face major, major challenges, but I'm confident that First of all, if African nations, the 54 nations that have signed this agreement, if they come together and are determined to effect and to make this uh, AFCFTA successful, I believe indeed uh, there will be tremendous uh, opportunities, opportunities for growth for Africa as a whole, opportunities for growth and development for each and every country in Africa. But of course, as, as you said, um, this will not come without, without, uh, without challenges. It will not come with that major, major effort to do those things that are absolutely essential to change the narrative. You have talked about, for instance, the issue of capacity. Uh, capacity to produce and the capacity, capacity to produce the goods and services that we'll be trading in. Um, you talked about the capacity uh, to create the necessary conditions, both within Africa and within individual countries that will facilitate this trade. Uh, we talked about the issue, for instance, of governance, the issue of regulation, the issue of policies. All this must, we must, we must look at them and uh, reconsider and re-engineer uh, our policies, our regulations, our ways of doing things in a way that will facilitate the effective, the effective uh, takeoff of the FCFTA. And herein lies the responsibilities that our governments and indeed our private sector entities uh, must take seriously because uh, it will not come uh, just like that. We have to make the effort. We have to uh, work together in particular, both public sector and private sector must work together seamlessly to ensure that AFCFTA will succeed.
All right. Uh, thank you so much for that insight, uh, Mr. Hartman. I, I've got a couple of uh, insights and questions. Uh, the, f the first will be, you know, are, are we ready to be able to uh, fight back the assault of dumping that will come into our economy? I mean, we just know what the pot is like in Lomé and Benin. And even with rice, even when our borders were closed, we saw how those pots were used. You know, the, the routine is you put mm -hmm. products in Lomé and Benin and then you ship them through the porosity of our borders into the country and those products find a way to the market. Uh, once you now say with AFCT the borders are open, how are we going to deal with that? Because Manufacturing Association of Nigeria too was reluctant to AFCT for a while because we have not put everything in place as regards infrastructure that is necessary for, you know, uh, the, the, the factories to work. And it's dwindled. Manufacturing used to be 10, about 10% sizable portion of our GDP back in the 80s. But now it's no longer the case. It's less than 2 3%. And also, what would the manufacturing sector do differently? Because there's an antecedent I want to cite for you. Agoa, for instance, which we thought that was going to be a launch pad for the manufacturing sector to get products into America, it's not the same. When you check out our Agoa outflows, most of the things we churn out are still crude oil. You know? And so what, what are they going to do different overnight yes. with all of these arrangements? So those two questions, sir. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the first question you asked is the issue of dumping. Are we, are we ready to do the thing that we have to do to um, uh, address the possibility of dumping by countries with the larger manufacturing capacities, with the more effective, more competitive uh, products? Yes, well, first of all, we cannot be 100% ready. But I believe that the first thing which is important, and by, by and large, this is why the Manufacturer Association in the first instance uh, raised uh, some concerns. The first thing which is important is to recognize, that what, to recognize that we have to do certain things to, to uh, create the capacity for us to engage in this kind of trade. Um, both at each, uh, within each country and perhaps across the, the, the continent between countries and between regions. Now, the dumping issue, frankly, is a situation of two things. First of all, political will. Do our governments have the political will? Do our leaders, political leaders, have the political will to agree on those things that we have to do? For instance, to ensure that we do not allow dumping to take place uh, and to make sure that these things work. The regulations we put in place for imports uh, of products from outside the region or even from outside each country are regulations that all other countries put in place. But the, different, the difference is that while other countries perhaps ensure that these regulations are complied with, uh, unfortunately in Africa our countries have not always done so. Let me take the issue of dumping for instance. The key issue is that if you have imports coming into your country, you want to make sure that they meet the quality specifications that you require. They also are fairly priced, and they are not imported into your country without compliance with the necessary regulations, such as custom duty payments and so on. If you do that and you insist, then you can create a, 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 an environment whereby, yes, those things that are able to come in do not necessarily um, displace your own, your own uh, uh, manufacturing capacity in place. However, the problem is these things have to work not just within each country but also across all countries. Neighboring countries must agree and work together uh, to ensure that they support each other, they comply with the necessary regulations in a way that enables each country to um, access, if you like, its market to ensure that its productive capacity, for instance, in manufacturing, is not unduly undermined. And perhaps you recall that uh, for almost a year, the government has to shut down the borders to stop dumping, particularly of products like rice and so on. Now, the reason for that is that if our neighbors have agreed to comply with the regulations that are in place, the ETLS, the ECOWAS uh, Trade Liberalization Scheme, which is agreed, which is set up to prevent that kind of dumping, perhaps there would have been no need to shut down our borders. So the first thing really that our country's uh, leaderships, our political leaders must build the uh, political will, the political 
um, uh, determination to ensure that whatever regulations we put in place within our countries and across the continent are regulations that will work and are regulations that support our economic, uh, our economic uh, growth processes. With regards to the issue of infrastructure we have referred to, of course, these are things that will take time. We cannot expect to, um, if you like, change the infrastructure to eliminate the infrastructure deficit overnight. But I believe that with consistent effort, both within our uh, individual countries and across countries, we can build the necessary infrastructure to support intra-African trade. Um, for instance, obviously, our ports are probably uh, among the most uncompetitive um, uh, maritime service providers in, in the world. And I believe that we have the capacity to resolve those issues if we want to. But we, we, we do it not only at the individual country, but also we must um, generally uh, agree in various regions, for instance, in West Africa or East Africa, to work together to build the, these capacities in, um, uh, in collaboration in such a way that all of us actually benefit. Uh, I believe also that uh, these regulations we're talking about in terms of um, trade facilitation regulations must be worked out in a way that enables our various